The fourth and last part of this lecture is now to make our application persistent. So we have deployed it to Heroku, we have implemented all the different endpoints. Now the only problem we have left is that uh, we have only used local variables. So whenever we restart, they're lost, they're sort of reinitialized. Uh, it's hard to distribute. So let's say our, uh, our load increases, we have a lot of users and we might want to have uh, multiple instances of our endpoints of our server, then they all have their own data and it's not very good. So instead we would like to use a database that then for example is persistent. We can restart, the data is still the same and we can have multiple applications that could access the same data and they all have uh, always the current state of it. We'll use MongoDB for this. You could use MySQL just as well. Uh, I use Mongo to show you something else. I use it because it's very common and I use it because it's for free included in Heroku as well. So we can also use it in the uh, deployed backend. Uh, MongoDB, just as most databases, has a number of things you get for free. You get unique IDs uh, that are auto-generated by Mongo, so you don't need to deal with this. Uh, you, of course, get efficiency. Databases are very well optimized uh, for these kind of use cases we deal with to quickly find something. You don't need to write the for loops yourself or so on. Uh, and there are some things which I put in parentheses here. There are some additional plugins you can use for Mongo and for uh, also for relational databases that, for example, give you input validation. You can define ranges and types for uh, for attributes and you don't need to deal with all the if-else statements that check whether the values are correct. Uh, and another thing I've already mentioned that sometimes you do not want to return the entire resource, maybe only certain attributes. And again, that's something that uh, a couple of plugins on top of Mongo allow you to do very, very easily. Now, uh, we use the MongoDB module for Node.js. That's, that's the official one. It's very basic, so it allows you to do all the different things. Uh, if you want to use MongoDB in production, so if, if you want to keep playing around with this stuff, uh, I would check out Mongoose, which is, a, uh, is a, a module on top of MongoDB that allows you to do a lot of things in a very efficient way. For example, this kind of input validation that I've talked about. So that's strongly recommended. Uh, the official website is mongojs.js.com. And then I also attached here a tutorial that shows you how to do this. And you can just install it in the regular way. But we'll use MongoDB. Now, uh, there are a couple of things you need to consider when you want to uh, write a persistent application. The first is we actually need to connect to our database. Uh, and for that, we need to have it running. So that's maybe where I can start here. I need to have a MongoDB installation. I have installed it on my computer. You can do the same. Uh, and then you run it. Just like every other server, this is a blocking command. So you see that it's just running. That's fine. Then we go into a different tab here. I will start my application. Uh, now, in the application itself, I need to, first of all, include Mongo, so that you have seen before, I do require MongoDB, and I actually uh, import the, the Mongo client, that's just a part of this framework. Uh, then I have to have the URL, in my case, that's MongoDB, you see this is a different protocol, we're not using HTTP. MongoDB colon double slash localhost uh, 2717. That's the regular uh, address for MongoDB. You can change this, you can run it on a different port, but that's the standard. Um, and then you need to connect to it. So you need to uh, use the Mongo client for this. Mongo client connect to the URL. And then as we are used to it, we have a callback function that gives us either an error or the database object. And this is then the object where we, that we use to, for example, insert new uh, to-dos in this case. Uh, if I cannot connect to my database, I'll throw the error, I'll just display it, I crash the application. Uh, it's maybe not the best way, but that's okay. Otherwise, I'll get my uh, one of my different databases. So on, on Mongo, you can store a lot of different databases in parallel. That's, uh, I'll just use this name. You don't have to create this before. Mongo does it automatically if it does not exist. So 
the first time I start this, this database will be created. Uh, and then this is just the same command as before for starting Express. So I actually make sure that I have a connection to the database before I start my HTTP server, my Express application. Uh, and please note that the DB object here, this is something I have defined up here because in my application I now want to access this for actually using the database. Now, uh, I'll walk you through the different operations, get, uh, post, put, delete, and show you how these things work. I'll go through them rather quickly, we might do a bit more in class, but it's just to show you an example what the difference is to before. Uh, in MongoDB, you do not have tables. Uh, instead, you have collections. That's something you have in document databases. So, but it's a very similar thing to a table. So if you know SQL, you can just imagine this as a table. So when I want to get all my users, I get the collection of all the users, the table of all the users, and I get all of them. Uh, I basically use a find command that's comparable to a select in SQL. Uh, and instead of the star in SQL, I just have the JSON brackets here that are empty. So basically I find uh, without any condition, find everything. And whatever is returned, I then convert to an array. Uh, and this is again a callback function thing, but once I get this array back, I return it. So this is, uh, these are two lines more than before. Uh, before that I only had a single line, but I'm actually accessing the database. I get everything back. Um, what I have not done here is error handling, and that's maybe something that is important. Uh, so let's just look into it. Here I have the entire application, so you can also look at it yourself later. Uh, get users, uh, I return 200. If there's an error, then maybe I should uh, return 404. And I just return the message, uh, users not found or something like that. Maybe this is something I need to investigate further in which cases I actually get an error here. This is from the to array function. Uh, so maybe this should actually be a 500 error uh, error when accessing database. So something is wrong in my collection. I cannot convert this to an array. So I'll just uh, give the arrow back arrow back to the user. This should work. Um, let's try it. I should update my code because I have some old uh, statements that don't work anymore with MongoDB. So I should do that. You see there's no error, app, uh, Express app is listening. This seems to work. Uh, let's try to do a slash users. And I have actually used this before. It's probably from last year. So I seem to have three users in my database. Um, what you might notice here is that uh, the ID looks slightly different. In MongoDB, uh, the underscore ID is basically the primary key. That's the auto-generated ID. Uh, and you see that is this strange string of numbers and characters. That's my unique ID. So that has worked. Um, that's great. That was again the easiest one. The important thing is we call the right operation on the database. If this would be an SQL database, you would have your select statement here. Uh, and then we would just return the array. If we want to create, and now this is really where, where the power comes in, um, where it gets much easier, we create our user array. So we just create a new user, sorry, object, the user object. Uh, we create a new object with username and age. Both of them are in our body. Uh, and then we just say db.collection, that's the same as before, insert one. So please insert one new uh, new file and we just give that function our JavaScript object. Uh, and then we again have a callback function. If there's an error, we do something. If we get the user back, this means it has worked. Uh, and then we return 
that one. The user object looks a bit strange, so we can look into that. Uh, there are a couple of other fields, but essentially the important part is uh, this one here. And then I return 201, we have created it. And we will see the important thing is what I put in is username and age. And what I get back is actually different. I get username and age back, but I also get the underscore ID. So I actually get something that the database has uh, worked with. So that's the request down here, this part. Uh, important, I still do the check whether all the parameters are there. So that has not changed. I still need to make sure that the request is correct. Um, and then I insert it. Again, I throw the error here. That's not very elegant. Instead, I should maybe return uh, that something has gone wrong. And talking about that, I also have errors in here. I should return if something is bad. Again, this is a server error. Something has not worked. It's not the client usually. So I should send 500 back. Um, again, let's try this. Post request. So I have to go into Postman. Uh, users. And now what I need to send is username and age. And I send. Uh, and I get something back. So first of all, I get 201 back, successful. And as you see, I get the username and the age back just as I've entered, but I also get the auto-generated ID. Uh, and if I now do a get request, I should have the user here as well. So that has worked. Uh, and also the important thing is now we have persistence. So if I close this and if I start it again and I do the same get request again, then I'm still here. So. This is now uh, much, much better. I do not anymore have my uh, objects just in the memory. So what I do is I create a regular JavaScript object that has all the right attributes, and then I insert it. Uh, with the standard Mongo module, there is no check whether this is anyhow conforming to a certain standard. So I can insert something that is completely different here. For example, I can remove age and I can put something else in there. Uh, the database does not check that. And in MongoDB, you can insert objects that have different format, no problem. Uh, so I can do a lot of mess here. And that's again, where I would like to point to, to Mongoose. There you have, for example, ways to say anything that's inserted into users has to have a username and has to have an age. And the age has to be positive or similar things. Here, there's no check, so we can do whatever we want. Uh, as I said, the important thing is that MongoDB actually auto-generates this so-called object ID here. Now, uh, let's do a specific one. We want to find uh, a user with a specific ID, and we get that ID from the parameters. Uh, we first have to convert it to an object ID, so it has to have the right format. Uh, that's, again, very specific to this case. Uh, and then we use again find, but this time we say find one. So find me a single uh, element from our collection that's equivalent to a select statement with limit one in SQL. Uh, and then we have here this curly braces underscore ID colon ID. This is basically a query. This is saying find me one element that where this condition is true. So this is to summarize the same as if you would do in SQL, select uh, star from users where underscore ID equals ID limit one. That's essentially the thing. And then the same as before, if we get an error, send back something. If we get the user, then uh, send the user back. <clears throat> Again, uh, that's the code that's here. So there is nothing specific here. Right, now we want to update something. Um, and what we need to do here is we need to uh, we need to find 
the right thing, the right object. So someone has requested to update the user with user ID. So again, we convert it to an object ID. Uh, then we create a new object that has the new values, username and age. So they have to be in the body. Uh, but then, and this is now something that is again specific to, uh, to Mongo, it might look different in different databases. Uh, we say use the set and this dollar here is an operator. So it basically tells Mongo set the following values to whatever we provide here. Uh, and then we say find one and update, find the entry with underscore ID equals to ID and update it accordingly, according to uh, this object. There are other, these kind of op operators, if you're interested as for example, want to remove certain things, uh, which can be good if you have a collection, you have an array and you want to remove one element out of it. So it requires a certain update operation, which we provide here. Uh, and that's then what we do. So we just update the specific things. You can implement the patch in exactly the same way. The only difference is again, that you need to check which of the two parameters you actually have available. Okay. And then finally we want to delete. Uh, deleting in Mongo is using a delete many. So that's for deleting more than one object from a collection. Uh, if we use the, the empty curly braces, it again means no condition. So just delete all of them uh, and we get something back. Now the, the weird thing in, in this standard Mongo module is actually that, uh, that we want to return all of them, but delete many actually does not return anything. So what we do here is we first get all of the users and when that is successful, we delete them and we return the user array. Um, so that's what we have done. Uh, all the other endpoints here are similar so that there is no, uh, there is no specific thing. Um, I will upload this so you can have a look at it. Note that I have not implemented all of these uh, endpoints, just some of them. You'll still see that there are some for loops to find the right things. Uh, if we would have used a more, okay, this one does not even use the persistence that explains it. Uh, if we would have used a more advanced database module like Mongoose, then a lot of the stuff you get for free. So for example, you see that the, the find, uh, finding a specific user ID does no longer require us to loop through things. So that's very nice. Okay, this works. Um, reasonably well. Now we want to get it back to Heroku. Uh, and the issue is uh, that again, we have something hard coded before that we had the port. We could not access the port because 3000 was the wrong value. Here it's the same with our database URL. Most likely we cannot directly access this because MongoDB is installed somewhere else. Uh, in Heroku, we again, similar to the port, we have an environment variable that uh, allows us to access the right URL. So we have to get that. And to actually get a Mongo database on Heroku, you can use MongoLab. So that's a service that uh, you can use to get an application, uh, a database. So if I, let's see whether this is still up to date or whether they have changed it. Uh, create Mongo app. So it actually now uh, is creating a new database. Uh, and I can change. I see that they are using a different uh, URI, a different environment variable. So probably they have changed uh, the way this works. Let's go into the application and have a look. If I go to resources, it says there are no, uh, okay, I'm, I ended up on a different application. Let's go there. I see it probably has added a, uh, yeah, there was already one. So that's not the one I want. I have already created one, but if you do not, uh, 
if you do not have any you can also do it here on the web interface that you can just search for MongoDB and you just uh, get a new database. This is again a, a plan so you see here it says free if you want a real database that has for example in this case the free version does not have any backup so if you lose the data is your problem uh, there are plans that then cost money so the cheapest one is 18 dollars a month uh, which is is quite some money but uh, you get it basically you don't need to uh, think about backup and stuff like that good let's try whether this works so now I have already modified it here you see this is my port that's made for deployment and here I have introduced the MongoDB URI so it's the same as with the port I just have an or statement that says if this environment variable is not available then just use this one instead so that I can use it locally um, and okay I'm in my that's why I already had a database because I was in the wrong folder um, Let's change it to our application that I worked with before. So I just use the Mongo uh, file, the one that I just changed, which means I need to update my package.json to actually use that one. And the dependencies need to be updated. So I have express body parser that's already there, but I also need to add MongoDB. That seemed to work. So if you look at the package.json, we now have the MongoDB dependency as well. Uh, and now I can add the database again, since I here I should not have one yet. So now it's added and they say the MongoDB URI gives me that information where it is. Uh, and now it, I should just be able to redeploy. I of course need to add the file that I have just created here. I commit this db added uh, and if I have done everything correct then this should work out of the box. being launched and it at least does not crash that's a good start if I go to slash users uh, I get some kind of error and that's not good let's see what it says if it says something yeah and here you see another issue that most likely is the problem here uh, that, as I said, I have uh, have used some kind of strange way of connecting to it that apparently does not work anymore. So that might simply be the problem. It might also be that there are simply no users. We can try to add one, uh, and then we'll see. So again, we are back to sort of debugging. Uh, how does our application work? Let's do a post and I want to send username and age uh, and again there is something wrong so this seems to indicate that the access to the database is actually uh, not successful uh, and what I could do is now go into the, uh, the different logs here to try to figure out what is going on so I could go to mongodb to mlab uh, and look at the log whether there's anything that has gone wrong but I won't be uh, doing this in detail now here but you see that this is now the next uh, problem that apparently this does not work as much as we would like to I could also be the 
the database itself. So there are, there are lots of things to debug always. Um, that's simply how you what you have to live with. That when you go from a local environment to a production environment, you have uh, a lot of different pitfalls that you might have to look at. So that's uh, as much as we'll do in, in terms of deployment. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention is uh, the use of middlewares. Uh, because Express allows you to do that. And in, in fact, we have been doing that all the time. Uh, and what a middleware is, you hear that word a lot in networking uh, applications, networking technology, is something that is somewhere in between, in the middle of our request response chain. So we send the request, we get a response back, and somewhere in between there, we do something. Uh, and what a middleware does is it receives both of them, request response. It does something with them so it can modify them, it can uh, trigger some other functions, and then it just passes them on, it continues. Uh, and that means that you can stack or chain them. So you can run five middleware functions in between uh, and it does not change anything. It's like, imagine the layered architecture, you just put layers in between that have the same input and output. You can put as many of those in between, it will not change the format anyhow. Um, and Express has an option to do that out of the box. And I have actually added it here. Um, <clears throat> what I do is I call app.use and app.use, I have already mentioned that, is simply take in whatever HTTP method uh, you send in. It doesn't care. So it can be a GET or a POST request or something else. And whenever it catches that, it just runs a function. Uh, and the function has, as before, request and response, and it has a so-called next parameter. Uh, and what we do in this case, we lock something, we lock the method and we lock the URL and the time. So which method is called on which URL when? Uh, and then we actually set something. We set, and this is a header, we are setting X logged to true. Uh, just in case you wonder, this does not mean anything. It's just additional information in the header that I can then, on my client side, I can read, for example. Um, and now comes the key part. We don't send any response here. We don't do res status 200 or so. We don't send anything back to the client. Instead, we call next. That's our parameter up here. Uh, and that causes Express to just continue with the execution. So it does not send anything back. It just continues here and checks, okay, is this a GET request? Then do something. Is it a POST request? Do something else. Uh, and the nice thing here is really we have done, we have added some functionality that's being called uh, and it does not affect the, the remaining endpoints. They just behave as before. Uh, in our case, what we have done is we have added logging functionality. So now our server, and you have seen that in the logs, we are actually logging every single request. So we see exactly which request comes in at what time. Uh, and that can be very good if you want to debug or if there's security issues, you can check that. Uh, so that's a common case for uh, using a middleware. Uh, the other thing that is interesting here, maybe we can look at that as well. Uh, I have already mentioned we are modifying the header uh, so if I go into uh, if I go into any of these requests and I look at the response, no, at the headers, the response header include X locked true. So this is what I have added. It's just additional information and you can use any you like. The convention here is usually, that's why I use the X, uh, everything that is not standard HTTP, you just Put an X in front of you. So, you, for example, here you see X minus powered by Express. That's essentially advertising that, Expre that Express JS adds to say this application has been uh, implemented using Express. So that's the second line here. I just set the header. Uh, you could also do other stuff like modifying the request. I can set the method to post. So no matter what kind of request comes in, I always make it a post request. Uh, that's not necessarily a good idea, but you can do that. You can mess with the request if you want. And then you call next. Um, and indeed, 
that's exactly what is hidden in here, for example. So when we tell Express to use the body parser to give us back a nice JSON uh, body, internally, the body parser is implemented as a middleware. So it does something, it actually modifies the request, it modifies the body so that it looks, that it's formatted properly, and then it calls next and we just continue. So that's exactly what's happening in here. Okay, so that was the last part of this lecture. Um, we have done a whole lot of things. We have uh, implemented an entire, almost entire uh, RESTful API. We have uh, deployed it. We have made it persistent with MongoDB almost to the end. I have not debugged why the connection doesn't work. Um, and we have looked at middleware very briefly. And of course, as you already see, the, the whole deployment part is really lots of configuration and lots of debugging why things work locally, but not on that machine. Uh, and that's a very common issue you have whenever you essentially distribute applications that you run into this. So this was just a, a small primer to give you some idea what is waiting when you want to deploy things. Um, and that's it for this lecture. We continue the next lecture with web security. We start uh, with with a discussion of attack surfaces. So essentially what is possible, how can attacks happen to, to a web application? Uh, and then we start off discussing authentication and authorization. So, so far, everything we have programmed is, is just open. Everyone can access it. Um, ideally, of course, we would like to protect certain things. And that's what we look at then. And then in the second web security lecture, lecture 19, we'll look at vulnerabilities and uh, actual attacks to websites. Thank you for today.